In this video, I'm going to be talking about one-dimensional random variables. In all fields of mathematics, the variable is an invaluable tool to express ideas and perform calculations. And the field of probability and statistics is no exception. Unlike deterministic variables, the value of a random variable is generally not known. And random variables are used to express anything that cannot be reasonably expected to be known exactly. Let me give you an example. Consider that you wish to predict the number of Republican voters in the next US election. Then it's certainly unreasonable to expect exact knowledge. Regardless of how much of an expert you are on US politics, there's no way you can predict the exact number of Republican voters. However, it's certainly reasonable to expect probabilistic knowledge. For instance, you can definitely say it's more likely that they get 100 million voters than that they get zero voters. And there are even some things you can say with certainty. For instance, you can be certain that the number of Republican voters will not exceed 330 million because that is the population of the country. And this is exactly the kind of scenario where a random variable is useful. When there's no way you know the exact number, but you have some sort of feeling of where it will end up. At this point, you hopefully have some intuitive understanding of what the random variable is. Because next, I'm going to describe a motivational problem that we will be able to solve at the end of the video using random variables. So assume that a man comes up to you in a metro station and offers you to play a game. And you only have two options. Either you accept this offer and play for money, or you decline and continue with your day. If you win, the man will pay you $3, but if you lose, you will have to pay him $1. And the rules of the game are the following. The man has a standard deck of 52 cards, which he shuffles. And you trust both the deck and the shuffle completely. You will repeatedly draw one card from the deck. And after you draw it, you look at the card. And if the card is not hearts, you put the card back in the deck, shuffle and draw a new card. But as soon as you draw a card with hearts, the game stops. And the victory condition is the following. If you draw four or more non-hard cards, then you win. But if not, you lose and you have to pay the man $1. And the question is basically, should you play against the man? Now, I think that intuitively you can have some idea here. I mean, clearly it's more likely than not that you lose. However, the payoff if you win is much greater than the loss if you lose. And I would say that without doing the calculation, it's not quite clear if it's a good idea to play the man. So in this case, it would be very useful to have the concept of random variable. I already gave a vague description of what a random variable was in the start of the video, but let's make it a bit more concrete now. Basically, a random variable describes a number that is associated with a random trial. And what do I mean by random trial? Well, I'm talking about some event in the real world, either an event that happened in the past, that is happening right now, or that is going to happen in the future, of which you do not know the outcome. And I use the word number here to highlight that the values that this random variable can take will always be numeric. And in the case of a one-dimensional random variable, it will be a single number. And let's look at some examples of what this number can be. Well, we had the example from before of the number of people voting for the Republican Party. It could also be the number of heads in a sequence of coin tosses. For instance, if I toss a coin 10 times, then this random variable could take any value between 0 and 10. Another example would be the sum of rolling two six-sided dice. In this case, the random variable could take any value between 2 and 12. And I want to be clear here that the random variable 
is not this number. Instead, the definition of the random variable, which you can see here, is that it is a mapping from a sample space to a real number. And the sample space here is the space of all possible samples that could, or all possible outcomes that could happen as the result of the random trial. Let's take a look at a simple example to clarify this. So imagine that you have this very basic game where you just roll a six-sided die. And if you get an odd number, you win $1. But if you get an even number, then you lose $1. Then the sample space, which is marked in red here with the red omega, refers to what is happening in the real world. So we have six possible outcomes of this random trial, which is the six numbers that is going to be face up on the die after rolling it. And this is something that is part of the real world, regardless of whether we are modeling this with a random variable or not. In contrast, the random variable, in this case, I marked it as x, is our belief or our model of how this outcome is going to look like. So the random variable consists of a description of the possible values, which in this case is plus $1 or minus $1, and a probabilistic description of how likely these values are to occur. And it's important to note the distinction between model and reality here. Because in this example, a very reasonable model would be that there's a 50% chance to win $1 and a 50% chance to lose $1. However, this is not the real world because it's impossible to build a perfect die. And you will always end up with slight irregularities in the shape that cause these probabilities to be something other than 50%. Next, I will give a mathematical description of the random variable. There are many different ways in which the random variable can be described. And one of those ways is using the probability mass function. Probability mass function is probably the most intuitive and easy way to describe a random variable, but it can only be used for discrete random variables. The idea here is basically just to give the probability of every possible value that the random variable can take. So for instance, in the coin flipping example from before, if you flip 10 coins in a row and you count the number of heads, you would have to specify 11 different probabilities to specify the PMF. And let's take a look at some notation here. So this is how you write the probability mass function. The P here stands for probability, and it's just the name of the function. The X in the subscript indicates that this probability mass function is describing the random variable X. And within the parentheses, we have the variable K here which is just a standing for any one value that the variable x could take. To clarify this, let's look at the simple die game from the previous slide. So in this game, the variable x could only take two possible outcomes, either plus one or minus one. And as we mentioned, a reasonable model for this would be to say that there's an equal chance of any of these two values happening. So you would say that the probability of x taking the value 1 is 50%, or equivalently 1 half. And the same goes for the probability that x takes the value minus 1. And since these are the two only possible values that x can take, this is a complete description of the random variable. Next, we'll give two properties of the PMF that are very useful to start calculating simple problems with random variables. The first property here basically is just saying that we know that any one of all possible values has to happen. And another way to say that is that there's a 100% chance that any value is being taken. So the mathematical, the mathematical notation here is that we take a sum of all possible probabilities for the value, random variable x. And we express all possible probabilities OK by us taking a sum from minus infinity to plus infinity. And all of these probabilities will always have to exactly sum up to 1. So there's a 100% chance that any one of these values is being taken. The second property here is related to a range. So here on the left side, we have the probability that the value of x is within this range. So it's 
lower bounded by A and it's upper bounded by B. So we basically want the probability that X takes any value inside of this range. And that can also be expressed by a sum. But now we have replaced the limits of minus infinity and plus infinity with the lower and upper limits of this range that we're interested in calculating. And we can calculate a small example problem just to use one of these properties. So as we mentioned before, one possible random variable would be to consider the sum of two six-sided dice. So in this case, we call that random variable x. And then we can ask ourselves any question about this sum. For instance, what is the probability of getting a sum that is greater than 10? Well, if you want to get a sum that's greater than 10, that's the same thing as saying that x is somewhere between the value of 11 and infinity, because all of these values are greater than 10. And of course, since we're talking about the sum of two six-sided dice, the maximum possible value we could get is 12. So it's equivalent to this expression here. And with this expression, we can use the second property of the PMF and insert all of the probabilities for the values within this range. So we see here that the probability of x being greater than 10 is equal to the probability of x being equal to 11 plus the probability of x being equal to 12. And these probabilities can be modeled, for instance, using the classical definition of probability. So in this case, the number of favorable outcomes is just a single outcome, because the only way to get 12 is that both of your six-sided dice have the value 6 on them. And the number of possible outcomes is 36, because you have two dice, and each die could take any of six values. And 6 to the power of 2 is 36. We have a very similar calculation for the probability that we get the sum of 11, but now we have two possible favorable outcomes. The first die could get the number 5 and the second 6, or the other way around, where the first die gets number 6 and the second gets number 5, which I have illustrated here on the left. When we have these two values, we just plug them back into our formula, and when we calculate everything, for instance using a calculator, we see that the probability is approximately 8%. So we have approximately an 8% chance of getting a sum greater than 10 when we roll two six-sided dice. At this point, we're ready to solve the motivating problem from the start of the video. So let's quickly reiterate the rules. If we win the game, the man has to pay us $3. But if we lose, we have to pay him $1. He has a standard deck of 52 cards, from which we repeatedly draw a single card and look at it. If the card is a hard card, the game stops, but otherwise it goes on. If in the end we have drawn four or more non-hard cards, then we win. But if we drew three or less, we would have lost. And our only real choice here is whether to play the game or not because as soon as the game has started, we have no influence on our probability of winning. And there are many different approaches one could take to make this decision. In my case, I have chosen to focus on the probability of winning. My reasoning is that, imagine that this probability would be exactly equal to 25%. Then for each win, we would on average have three losses, which would mean that we would make a net profit of $0. So if our probability is less than 25%, we should not choose to play the man. And there are some things that we know right off the bat, just based on our knowledge of this deck. So for any one card being drawn, the probability that it is a hard card is 1 in 4, or 25%. Similarly, the probability of the card not being hard is 75%, or 3 in 4. And we'll call these probabilities P and Q, respectively. Next, we'll go on to define a random variable. In this case, we'll have a random variable that describes the number of non-hard cards that are drawn before the first hard card. Why this variable? Well, because it immediately tells us the winning condition. And to describe this random variable, we'll use the probability mass function, as we described previously. 
And let's see how we can calculate the probability of winning. Well, the probability of the, a win is exactly equal to the probability that this random variable x ends up in the range of 4 to infinity. And because we have this second property of the PMF, which we learned earlier, we know that this probability is exactly equal to a sum. Specifically, the sum of the PMF, where k ranges from 4 to infinity. However, we cannot start calculating individual values for this PMF and insert into the sum because we have an infinite number of values, and that's going to get a bit difficult. So let's see if we can try to simplify it. First, I make this claim here that this sum on the right side here is exactly equal to these two sums on the right side of the second line. How can I make this claim? Well, let's look closer at these sums. So the first sum goes from zero to infinity. In other words, we have the probability that x takes the value zero, plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, and so forth. And the second sum here just goes from zero to three. So we just have four terms here. And if we take the first sum and subtract the second sum, clearly these first four terms disappear from the infinite sum. And then we have a new sum starting at four, moving on to infinity just like we have on the right-hand side here. Okay, so that's my argument that these two are the same. But why is the second expression better than the first? We still have an infinite number of terms here. Well, we can use the first property of the PMF, which basically says that this infinite sum here is equal to one. So now we have quite a simple formula. It only contains five terms. One term here and four terms here. At this point, we have our random variable, x, which was the number of non-hard cards drawn before the first hard card. And we have a simple formula for the victory condition based on the PMF. So all that really remains now is to calculate the individual values of this PMF for these four values of k. Let's do this and start with the value of k equals zero. So in the case of k equaling zero, what is actually happening here? Well, k equals zero means that we didn't draw a single card before the first heart card. So basically we just drew a card from the deck, it was heart and we lost immediately. And what is the probability of that happening? Well, it's one in four, so it's 25% as we explained previously. If the random variable x is equal to one, that means that we must have drawn one card first that was not the heart card, and then we drew a heart card after that. And the probability of that happening is simply the multiplication of these two probabilities, which ends up being about, or exactly, 18.75%. Moving on to x equals 2, we have drawn two cards that was not hard, and then we drew a hard card. So we get a square here, and we end up at about a 14% probability. At this point, I think you can probably see a pattern here. So we can just give the general formula for px of k. So px of k is equal to q to the power of k times p. And q and p are really just stand-ins here for three-fourths and one-fourth. So here is the formula in general for the probability of drawing k cards before the first hard card. Now we can insert this number into our probability of winning up here, and we get the following. And here, so here is the formula from up here. Here we have inserted this to get this formula here. And then in the end, it ends up just being numerical. And this you can calculate yourself using a calculator or any programming language. And it turns out that this probability is approximately 32%, which means that we should play the man. To me, this seems a little bit unintuitive, but the math doesn't lie. You can try to play this game for yourself and you should see that about 32% of the time you actually win this game. So this man is actually being very generous and we are making a lot of money. We choose to play him for a long time. Okay, that marks the end of the video. If you want to learn more about probability, I have a few recommendations. First of all, this probability mass function that we ended up with it's actually a very famous probability mass function that is known as the geometric distribution. 
So you can look up, for instance, the Wikipedia page on this uh, distribution, and you'll see that this is a much more general case that solves a lot of different problems. Another thing you could look, look into is continuous random variables. In this video, I only talked about discrete random variables, and it turns out that random variables behave very differently when they become continuous, specifically because we can no longer use the PMF, so you need another way to describe the random variable mathematically. I made one video in the past, and I'm planning to make 13 more, so you can also choose to watch my other videos. And finally, this is a book that I take a lot of inspiration from when making these videos, written by Gunnar Blum. I think it's a fantastic book that is very pedagogically written. And here I am. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you learned something interesting. Goodbye.